thank you so much for joining us for our third edition of In Conversation with Dr. Lisa Corrigan. Um, we, uh, we started off this series sort of very broadly talking about allyship and um, have now honed in on a topic that I think is very relevant for our audience, um, which is, I believe, why all of you are here. Uh, this evening, we'll be talking about white femininity, anxiety, perfectionism, and justice. And even the title of this really hits the nail on the head for me on a lot of things. And uh, so I, I'm really, really excited to dig on, on this one. So for those of you who don't know, Dr. Corrigan is a professor of communications, the director of gender studies program and affiliate faculty in both African and African American studies and Latin American studies in the Fulbright College of Arts and Sciences at the University of Arkansas. She is a feminist rhetorical scholar who researches and teaches in the areas of social movement studies, the black power and civil rights movement, prison studies, feminist studies, the Cold War, and the history of public address. We at Arkansas Arts and Fashion Forum are thrilled to have her here again. Um, I love that this was a started as a sort of like, would it be a good idea? And now here we are, I, what feels like seven years later on our third edition. Um, for those of you that are joining us because you are Dr. Corrigan's audience and not our audience, welcome. We are the Arkansas Arts and Fashion Forum. We are a nonprofit organization dedicated to uh, we. The elevator pitch is incubating the fashion industry in Arkansas, but we also do quite a bit of work on uh, diversity and equity in Northwest Arkansas and focus a significant amount of our work on representation specifically. So we felt like expanding on this uh, conversation was really useful for our, not only ourselves as learners, but for our audience as well. So a couple of notes on how this will work. Um, we will be taking questions as we go in the chat to Rachel Woody Pumford. She's the host of the meeting. So if you will message her privately your questions, they will get looped into my Google document and I'll ask them as we go. And then at the end, we'll have a sort of question and answer session. But for just for sort of streamlining thing, things, it's a lot easier for you to send them to us and then we'll filter them in. Um, if this goes the way the last couple have, we'll anticipate probably an hour, 15, hour and 30 minutes. Um, obviously it's Zoom, so you, you can, you know, <laughs> pop in and out if you need to. There will be a recording of this uploaded to our YouTube channel um, within probably a couple days. So uh, again, Dr. Corrigan, thank you so, wait, one more thing. Also, Dr. Corrigan has just released a book. <laughs> It is called Black Feelings, and it is available on Amazon and for Kindle, which I think is really, I was actually trying to buy it a couple weeks ago, and it wasn't out on Kindle yet, so I passed, but it's on Kindle now, so let's go. Um, and I think uh, that book is on Black Feelings. Her last talk was on White Feelings. I hope, I think maybe we're going to get a book in the future, another feelings book, um, but it would be, I'd be remiss if I didn't tell you about that new publication. So Dr. Corrigan, thank you so much for joining us again. Should we just get right to it? I feel like it, Robin. Thanks for hosting. It's nice to see you and Rachel again. I appreciate the time. Also, I think that this conversation happened because basically I started ranting about white perfection and anxious white ladies. And then the chat box freaked out <laughs> like two months ago when we started this. So I'm, I'm happy that we got to uh, circle back to it in a full conversation. Yeah, no, absolutely. I think that we, uh, a lot of people and myself very much included are really trying to figure out how we become our best activist selves and a huge stumbling block for a lot of us is that perfectionism that comes along with all the things we're going to talk about tonight. So hopefully, hopefully very useful. So let's start. Question number one. Uh, what would you say are the main features of dominant white femininity? How do these features produce white privilege for girls and for women? So I think that there are features of white femininity, but they change over time. So for the purposes of this conversation, we're going to talk about the United States, although I'm happy to do some comparative work in some of the Q&A. Um, I think that the dominant ones have, have been talked about extensively in um, public scholarship, uh, especially between the 17th and the beginning of the 20th century. So there we're talking about piety, right, devotion to God, purity in terms of mind, thought, and deed, especially sexuality, 
submissiveness, which also includes obedience, and then domesticity. And I think those, although they are incomplete, are a good way of thinking about the way that white women have been um, groomed. I like that term grooming because it, it has tinges of sexual abuse language in it. And I think that white femininity is very much about being groomed to be a particular type of white body that is gendered as female. So piety, purity, submissiveness, domesticity. I think um, the thing that I would add to that, especially in the 20th century, is civility politics. Although the 19th century especially is more sentimental, I think the 20th century is really uh, interested in white women who produce discourses of respectability. And how do they function? Well, it, it now in, in modern America, they start as with little kids, right? Kids get gendered when they're in diapers and they get gendered in preschool. So the longitudinal data is very clear that little girls in like preschool, they're disciplined differently. So they're taught to take up less space with their voices. They're taught to take up less space with their um, physical bodies. The type of play that they're allowed to engage in is gendered, right? The type of duties that they take on even in the classroom is gendered. So, so th this, this notion of white femininity begins at birth, right? The grooming begins at birth in the way that women comport themselves, the way that they're allowed to take up space through verbal speech and through their bodies, and, and the way that they're taught to play, right, or be disciplined in the culture. And I think that that over time, the product of that kind of social education, whether it's in formal education or in the home, is that it produces a kind of dis disciplined respectability where white women are asked to be good white girls. Right. So all of the white women here who are nodding along, they're asked as little, be good, be a good girl. That's what good girls do or that's not what good girls do. And that's in contrast to to girls of color. Right. Who are disciplined at far higher rates, although not as high as especially black men in, say, pre-K classrooms or K through 12. But they're disciplined differently. So so white women are disciplined in a bunch of ways that are not as severe as kids of color. Right. Either women or men or or kids who have who are differently gendered. So I would say that that produces um, good girls, right, who are supposed to be respectable, and they have to adhere to certain kinds of decorum. And I would say the number one characteristic that they're supposed to produce is silence. So white women, one of the things that defines them is their fidelity to not speaking up about their own trauma or violence that's happening to them or violence that's happening to their children or violence that's happening to their neighbors or violence that is happening to people who don't necessarily look like them or who grow up like them. And so instead of speaking or taking up space, white women are taught to be as small as possible, physically as small as possible, and in terms of their verbal space, as silent as possible. That's... That hit, that hit me. That one's pretty profound. Um, the silence part hit the you? The fidelity of not speaking up. Yeah, that uh, was worded really well. So that distracted me. Um, <laughs> how are white girls and women trained to produce this femininity uh, throughout life, youth, adolescence, adulthood? So when they're little, they have to be good for daddy. Bell Hooks calls it doing it for daddy. She's talking about movies, but be good or your daddy's going to be in charge. Your daddy's going to come home or what about daddy, right? So there's always this external masculine disciplinary force that is the constant boogeyman for white femininity, right? So if the daddy's not your literal biological dad, there is always another daddy to take his place. It's a work daddy or a church daddy or a neighbor daddy, right? Who is always going to be there to enact this kind of discipline. And so it teaches girls and women how to produce a normative femininity. And in my case, I'm really interested in the communication practices that come from that. So in terms of race, it teaches white women that to be a good girl or to be a respectable white woman is to not talk about racism or not talk about violence. So they euphemize, right? So they create fake language that doesn't describe the situation to deal with racism or white supremacy. They also use passive voice. So something like um, Africans were brought to the United States, right? It's passive voice. Who brought them? They weren't brought, they were stolen. Stolen and brought are two widely different words. 
and and there's a different sense of agency. Um, they disembody, I think, in terms of their language, like um, that who's in who's responsible for this? Well, they are those people, not me, right? So there is this like rejection of personal agency that's a part of white normative feminine com communication practices. And then I would say hyper politeness. So we can't talk about that in polite company. We don't talk about that at the dinner table. We don't talk about it at Thanksgiving. We wouldn't talk about that with family. Don't talk about that with strangers. Don't bring that up in church. Don't ask the pastor that. Don't talk to your teacher that way. Just think about how many of the invocations, right, around femininity generally, but especially white femininity, are about producing a particular type of communication practice that's about not speaking. And I think that creates an absence of a context for anti-blackness. So if you're taught to speak and behave in that way, that creates no real possibility to acknowledge a history of colonization or enslavement that you or your ancestors have participated in or benefited from, it becomes very difficult then to talk about it with other people. So if you are then 45 and are like, what is BLM? You have 45 years where you have not been talking about race and have no skills, right? Because that's not something we talk about at dinner. That's not, we, we don't talk about that with the neighbors and that's something we talk about. And so I think that um, that creates a culture then for girls and women where the stakes are so high to screw up that any failure feels like it's a catastrophic loss of self. So, you know, it, you know, Robin D'Angelo is getting a bunch of flack for white fragility right now from a bunch of people who really have no business writing about it, i.e. Matt Taibbi and others. But I do think that for white women in particular, uh, it's really important to understand that white people have fragile egos. And the whole reason that there is not a larger conversation about anti-blackness as it pertains to white supremacy is because they cannot admit how much they benefit from it. And that's because they're matriculated as girls and as young women to not speak up, not ask questions, not read books, not date people who are not like them, not, not, not. It's just a series of prohibitions that disincentivize them from learning about it and disincentivize them from speaking about it. So by the time they're an adult, they've never taken up any rhetorical space that critically interrogates their gender or racial identities. Whereas people of color have to do it every day as they code switch through all of this cultural landscape that's hostile to them, right, as a way of survival. So there's this asymmetrical communication landscape that white women have intentionally been cut out of so that they cannot agitate for their, their freedom or the freedom of others. How does being a white woman feel? I think for a lot of white women, it's the most anxious thing possible. So I would say the majority of white women that I meet who are in this cage, I think is the best metaphor, right? They can't see what's agitating the shit out of them. Okay, the, uh, so there's a metaphor that Marilyn Fry used like in the 90s to talk about um, privilege and oppression. And she used the birdcage for this reason, because you can see one tine in the birdcage, but you can't see them all at once. And you don't know that you're in the cage. You can just see one feature of the oppression at a time. And so what do you do? You, you nest in it, right? You paper it over and you make it pretty, right? And you fill it with things that distract you from how shitty it is and how terrible you're being. And so I think that for a lot of white women, whiteness feels like a constant anxiety because they're getting it from every side they feel like, right? That's not the objective reality, but because they've been created and produced through this, this culture of hyperviolence, uh, and they are not allowed to take up space, they are perpetually anxious and they can't articulate why. They just know that there's always going to be an external daddy out there, right? And so even it, even if the daddy's not there, somebody else is going to be substituted in to discipline them, right? Which is why they don't want to speak out because somebody else is going to call them out which is why call out culture makes them so sad in their faces. And then they're going to have to take responsibility with no language that they have ever practiced. So I think for a lot of white, I think the majority of white women feel tremendously anxious and also totally lonely. 
because one of the things that this silence does is then it it it, it inhibits solidarity in, in meaningful ways. So they can't connect with sexual partners because heterosexuality did not prepare them to do that when there are asymmetrical communication resources between white patriarchs who are male and white patriarchs who are female. They don't have, they're not on the same page. They don't have the same goals. They don't have the same interests. They don't have the same property, right? Like you're not choosing your heterosexual relationship if he makes more money and you're doing it for health insurance. That's not love, right? So like that entire architecture of romance, I think has really done a number on white women in the United States because they have replaced rights with sentimentality, right? They want romance and not freedom. So they, so white women have no vocabulary for freedom, which is why they have no vocabulary for solidarity. They don't even know that, that they are also trapped in a bunch of white supremacist nonsense. And so when they do talk about whiteness and gender, they talk about it as they or them or white men or anybody else but me, which makes it very difficult for them then to, to agitate for their own freedom. <laughs> this I'm this one's really getting me, Lisa. <laughs> I know, I see it. That's all right. You can wiggle over there in your seat. I'll wait. I'm like, <laughs> I'm like lots of sad frown nodding, right? Like, yeah, yes, but, but okay, but also this. that's good. That's good, yeah. Ron, because it's also ambivalence, right? White women are ambivalent about everything. Who am I? I don't know. What do I want? I don't know. What should I do? I don't know. It's all ambivalence all the time. And so it's hard for them to ground in a particular view viewpoint of justice because they don't even know what they want. If you can't articulate your desire, you can't actualize it. So all of that language of desire is part of the matriculation of women that's been cut off. If you ask women, what do you want? They will undoubtedly say, I don't know, mm -hmm. I don't know. Because they're not allowed to want. And if they do, then it has to be driven towards like consumption or capitalism because that's how you right. make a perfect woman. Right. So, Handbags, okay, right? You yeah. want that. You can but... want mm. you can want debt. You can want debt. Here's a credit card. Here's student yeah. loan debt. Yeah. Right? Because white women also don't know how money works. If you don't know how compounding yeah. interest works, I'm sorry, but you're going to definitely be forced into a bunch of contracts that you can't pay off based on wage labor. How's that child care crisis working out for everybody right now? Oops, didn't learn about that. I mean, there's all this stuff that fundamentally constrains the lives of women generally, but white women in particular, they have absolutely no knowledge about until, right, the train is off the tracks and we're all skidding into the abyss. So, you know, better late than never, though. Well, here we are. Uh, so, well, better late than never, you're right. Better late than never. Uh, uh, what are your thoughts on the kinds of experience that shape white girlhood? I think white girlhood is a series of indignities and traumas that they that are inflicted upon them and then that they inflict on others. So I think white women get pinched in a lot of ways where they are like there's a bunch of structural violence in the white home that does not exist in the same in the same degree or at the same numbers in homes of color where they are being victimized by family members and neighbors right and at way higher rates so there's a ton of violence in the home that's enacted upon them but then they're also asked to produce and reproduce that violence on others as a way of proving their fidelity to daddy or mommy right so i think sarah's here in California. She just wrote this amazing piece for the LA Review of Books on Stephanie Jones Rogers, They Were Her Property, Women as Slave Owners. And that book, if you have not read that book, that's like straight the must read of the last year in my mind about the history of white women in America. It is a page turner. It's gorgeously written. But like we, it's white women were out there raping slaves, definitely tons, definitely, definitely, definitely enjoying tremendous amounts of brutality on the plantation and right building and replicating its structure through the teaching of white children. So white women as a part of their privilege are being asked to produce violence as a way of demonstrating their fidelity to other white people. And so I think that that's what creates, you know, all this anxiety is because they're that violence is happening to them and they are producing violence simultaneously. And at the end of the day, they still don't own property, right? They're not the CEOs. They don't control the media enterprises. That really smart lady used her email, sat on her BlackBerry and didn't get to be president. Like they're not getting 
the things that they think that they should be getting, right? Because they bought into this idea that if they were just respectable and they were just civil enough or pretty enough or smart enough or worked harder or leaned in, then somehow they would get the magic rewards of patriarchy. And I have to tell you, it's not coming. Prince Charming's not coming. The money's not coming because you don't understand, you don't actually get to own property. The fact of the matter is that the country started with white women as property, although not chattel slaves, but definitely as property, and they still don't own property independently in their own name. Like that is the fundamental conundrum. If you are property, you cannot be free. And it's not the same in degree or in kind. It is not, it's fundamentally different. And yet freedom is the goal. So if you don't own property and you are still considered to be property of your father or your husband or your boss or whatever, then you are not gonna have the rights to exercise in, a, in public life. You know, and so, you know, what do I think produce? I think tremendous violence and trauma produces white femininity and then they reproduce it with their children and with against people of color. I mean, I just think about, you know, we live in Arkansas, a bunch of the folks here. OK, Fabus closes schools in 58 because the white women didn't want to send their kids to school with the black boys. The white women stopped desegregation efforts in the South. The white that's it was all the white moms got together and clammed up to stop that. That's non-negligible. So I would say public education is in crisis in this moment. It's a good, it's a good place to think about. What do we say from public education going in the future? Do we save a bunch of the white moms who also want to resegregate public school? Because they're the same people, right? Anyway, end rant. I feel like we're teeing up ourselves for another one of these on the on the topic of resegregating public schools right now. I mean, you know, I've been timely. down in the trenches. It is, I don't know. It's a shame to me that this public school teachers have not been taught more about history. <laughs> I yeah. mean, it's, and also science. I mean, America is such an anti-intellectual place. It could not be clearer in this political moment to anybody who's paying attention. Uh, okay here. Um, how is a normative or conventional model of white femininity created, maintained, and incentivized? I think it's obviously created from birth and through education. And so we've talked a little bit about what's happening in the home. In public schools, the discipline is happening in the tracking. So like if let's say you're a white chick and you want to go to med school, they're going to pretty much force you to go into OBGYN obstetrics or gynecology or pediatrics. So there, that's why there are so few women neurologists or surgeons or whatever else, right? Because the money is in those other things. So even when white women do achieve whatever that means, they're still getting tracked into other stuff through disciplinary mechanisms that funnel them out of careers that make a bunch of money so that they don't earn property. Um, I would also say the white church is a scary place for white women. And so especially in the South, I mean, the South is full of cults and it's full of denominations that are extremely violent. I mean, I say this is a lapsed Catholic where all the child abuse has been hidden for, I don't know, centuries. So it's not like it's just in the South at all. But I mean, the white church is a scary place for children generally, but for girls um, in this particular context. And so I think that, um, you know, those are places where the discipline happens and where the violence happens and it shapes them. I think that women are both incentivized and disincentivized to perform conventional and normative femininity by money. Right. So <clears throat> the pretty civil woman who doesn't produce um, discord, right, or challenges is going to get paid off by daddy boss or by the more competitive women in the workplace who don't want competition. So that happens at work. It also happens in church. It also happens in the home, right? So they are financially, women who produce conventional normative white femininity are financially incentivized to be silent and to take up less space. So that means the people who do take up space, the unruly bodies are disincentivized and they're punished, right? So they're demoted or promotions are withheld or, you know, it's, it's like what happens in the United States when you turn down a drink at the bar, it goes from, would you like a drink to fuck you die bitch in like 10 seconds, right? That's like an incredible lapse of time to shrink your freedom into an object who could totally be killed in the back of the bar. That is not a reasonable way to live. 
<laughs> it's just like not reasonable. And so, but everybody just sort of accepted it. It's like, oh, that's just how it is. Well, you know, and then you get all of the, the man words about she dressed that way or she acted that way or whatever. But at the end of the day, the time lapse between, hey, baby, would you like a drink? And no, thank you, moves immediately to you're, you're either a lesbian or you should be dead. Like there's no space, right, to exist and produce freedom when when that becomes a dominant narrative in women's lives. If you think about it sexually, the majority of women talk when they talk about their first adolescent sexual experiences, almost all of those are traumas. So girls report that the very first time that they they understood that they were sexual body was that their bra was snapped or they were deep pants or somebody pulled their skirt down on the bus. Right. Boys do not have that as white boys do not have that as a general rule as their first sexual experience. OK, at all. So they're they are produced as sexualized bodies. They're traumatized in the home at church and in work, and they're financially incentivized to produce the most domesticated version of white femininity possible through money and through promotion. So those two things are happening simultaneously. They're incentivized and then disincentivized. Right. From from contradicting that model. So it's a cat. So this, it's no wonder white women are anxious, right? They're ping ponging between, you know, these spaces and there's no language for them to find freedom or solidarity because they're competing with one another. Right. So that's why they mob up at each other. That's why mean girls exist. Yes. That's a, that's a hyper American thing. The mean girls in adolescence where you're going to pick on the girl who doesn't have the right shoes or the right jacket or whatever, because at a very young age, they already understand that the accessories are the substitute for freedom. And so you have to have the right ones to be included. That is that is an, an example of how the incentivization and disincentivization happens. Uh, what do you think about that, Robin? <laughs> well, I have a housekeeping note, um, which is. Uh, Tammy, I got your question. Will everyone send their questions to Rachel Woody Pumford? Because if you send them to me and I have to type them over, then I can't listen to what Lisa's Thanks. saying. I can actually only do a couple things at a time. So uh, questions go to Rachel. So she'll type them in the chat, in the in my question list, so I can keep up. But Tammy, we're, you're fine. We're going to get, your question actually comes up later. So we'll get to it in about four or five questions. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and go to the next question, <laughs> but I think it's actually, it's the flip side of the one that I just asked before, because, uh, there's a lot of, uh, there's a, an ability to sort of situate oneself as the victim in that narrative of like, you know, well, how is there space for me if, if it goes from, no, I don't want to drink to, I should fucking die within that 10 second span. So it's a, we can create a sort of like, woe is me. This is really hard on me as a white woman. Sure. But, but simultaneously we are, our femininity is also producing and reproducing patriarchy. Can you speak to that point? Yeah, it's a both and. Okay, there are no people who are totally free and there are no people that are totally and completely oppressed. That's a giant range of, of space, right? Like, you. You know, the detention is a different thing than having an asshole father, okay? Those are wildly divergent experiences of a lack of freedom and of access to degrees of freedom. So there are no people that are totally free. That's not a real thing. The whole point is that it's, we're struggling to get there, right? It's not a, a condition that is certainly possible in the United States in this political moment. Freedom is not the thing that we're doing. We're doing really hard the opposite. That totally not doing freedom. That is not on the menu. Nobody's getting it. We're doing the opposite in every possible facet of public life, not on the menu. So that means that white women need to see themselves both at, in a way that, in ways that they are victims and in ways that are perpetrators. And also that applies to all of the other people. There are no people who are just perpetrators. Even if we look at Trump, there's a reason nobody, he does never talks about his mom. His, his, his childhood was the Hunger Games. It was like basically the template for that. That was the entire bourgeois, new money, non-wasp America of the 1940s. Like they are all that person where they were rigorously trying to get as much power and money as possible. And also that's the story of America. The entire cotton oligarchy of the South was fundamentally that way. I posted a thread today from Twitter that by a historian who writes about how um, new aristocrats in the South 
would sell off slaves to basically pay for their oldest sons to go to college so that they could produce a different kind of bourgeois identity in early America. Okay, so like basically that white dude's Harvard education, Tom Cotton, uh, came off of the backs of that was that good. That was a lot of that was a lot of teeth there. It was a lot of vocal. Ch thank you. That you that person's actual life and their entire connection to other people was sacrificed so that the white dude could go to college. And that just gets replicated once white women get to be slightly more free after the 1920s. But, the, you know, we're in this moment where everybody's pulling down statues. What do we do with the suffragettes? Do we pull down their statues? They were racist as shit. They basically sacrificed, right, the end of slavery so that they could get girl rights. Do we pull down those statues? There's, I think, a compelling argument to do so. And I think in some ways, second wave feminism has occluded how much white women both have stood in solidarity with people of color and also have destroyed them, sometimes simultaneously. So it's never like you're the hero or you're the victim. That's not real, right? It's just about the degrees of freedom and how can we all get more free together? And now I'm in a Dead Prez album, basically. Continue. Um, I think we all are familiar with the term toxic masculinity at this point. I think that's something that we can all speak to. Um, what about toxic white femininity and how did oh go ahead oh how does it work in the family on the one hand and in the workplace on the other yeah so i think this is where everybody got caught up last time which is why everybody was like can we do one on that because i there are very few people talking about toxic, toxic white femininity but if I, I talk about it a lot right so for me especially in this kind of space the toxic white feminists are like oh well i bought ibram kendi's new book but didn't but they're not going to read it Right. Or they did read it and they're like, I mean, I don't know. This stuff happened so long ago. Like, what can I really do? Right. That shit's toxic. Right. To, and it's also I think I was running when we when that we thought about this idea about the white women who want to go to protests, but then just want to take pictures of all the black people. Right. So it's like racial tourism, like protest as racial tourism. We're like cruising black people. So we're like in with the protest, but we don't like know that we're actually at a cop rally instead of a protest. So like that whole inability to like read the scene is part of toxic white femininity. But it's also white lady tears, right? I work with a lot of criers. And so not in my immediate department, but higher ed is full of crying people. And they, you know, it's like they're, that's how education works. So the crying about being wrong or the crying about being confronted or the crying about like really low level shit that is toxic because then it shunts off a bunch of emotional labor into other people and then it deflects from fixing the thing that's racist or screwed up. And so that's a toxic behavior. I think the way that white women, especially in the South, like, I don't know, debutante culture is wild to me as, you know, as a Northern. I'm like, what, why are you, why are you, why, why are you doing that? Like, why, why, what? What is the purpose of that? And you're just teaching them to be little good, like white, and you're gonna, they're going to mate with other white people so that you can reproduce white wealth. Like, let's just call it what it is. These are arranged marriages. You're teaching them and grooming them about what a good white family is and how to find one and how to marry one and how to good, get a good white in-law. And it's all about family as property and status. So, you know, toxic white feminine is also about producing kids whose only option is to produce white lady fantasy. Right. So that's the boys who are like the star of the thing. Right. Who are who or who are, you know, the convicted rapist who only got three months in jail and then got out on good release. Right. He was a good kid. Don't ruin his life. Those that's toxic white femininity. Those moms are terrible. Toxic white men, femininity is also like over identifying with the daughter and trying to control her life. Right. Trashing the people she dates either through racism or classism or homophobia or whatever. And it's also, uh, you know, the codependence. So, you know, on a college campus, I've got all these parents who want to call their daughter every day, all day, want to be in every aspect of their life, can't disindividuate at all. They just want to merge so completely with their daughter that they control every aspect of her life. And so the, the girls have no way to manage boundaries. 
So then they get into terrible relationships with terrible people because they don't know how to say no, or that's wrong, or that's unethical, or we shouldn't do that, or I don't want that. And so that, that toxic femininity is what is, it's not the dads are not, dads are not raising kids, period. They're not raising children. They are participating more in children's lives now. And that's a good thing. And that's probably definitely the most important thing that second wave feminism did for the family in some ways. But on the whole, men are not raising children. Okay, they're not making the snacks. How many snacks snacks did y'all make today? I made 42 snacks today. Okay, at least 42 snacks. So they're not doing that. They're, They're not doing the domestic labor, right? Because then they still get to be the breadwinner. So they can just check out of the, you know, managing morals and managing ethics and, you know, producing community and whatever. And so even when, even though now men are, anticipate they're expected to participate some like you have to participate in carpool they also then still choose the sexy chores cooking oh isn't that creative right but not cleaning which sucks right being outside in the yard right creative right mending shit not i mean you know how i feel about the textile arts i'm already on right on record there but nonetheless that's not what the men are doing so you know that then creates this second shift you know, imbalance that produces more resentment and anxiety that has nowhere to go and just festers in the home until it explodes either in the workplace or, you know, by destroying, you know, whatever was there. And, you know, I'm not invested in what happens with that resentment, except that I want it to be political and ethical, right? So these relationships shouldn't be happening with such imbalance to begin with because they're toxic. And, they're, and it's not that they're just toxic on the female side. We, ju- we only talk about patriarchy as something that men do, but women are producing it and they're wanting it and they are reproducing it in their children as an expectation. So they become, the moms become the daddies, I guess is what I'm saying, which it serves nobody. And, and right. <laughs> um, I'm going to, I'm going to put sort of two questions together in this next one. Um, <laughs> Can we talk about how toxic white femininity affects people of color in the workplace and the relationship uh, to achievement trauma and how that plays into normative femininity? Yeah, I'm gonna go with the first one, okay? Because white women overproduce, okay? They overproduce at work. And they can do that because they're white, right? So they're not weighted down with racism and classism and, and homophobia right, or, or ableism in the same way or to the same degree. So they have more mental and physical energy to manage whatever's happening with the crap at work. And so they overproduce labor. Okay, so that is the, you know, 10 paragraph email that should have been a phone call. That is overproducing labor. Okay, that is the, let's set up a diversity committee, but then not implement the stuff. That is producing more labor. Now, who has to serve on those committees? Who has to generate the ideas? Who writes the reports that go nowhere? That is generating labor that is not helpful. And so, you know, in addition to just the general affect and the anxious ennui that white women produce, their perfectionism and overwork then drives up the standards for everybody else, who is also simultaneously, they are being denied resources to actually achieve the thing, right? So if all, in in the academy, if your white research is being funded, right, times a million degrees because you're white, and other people of color are not being funded because of who they are, because of what they study, then you are driving up expectations under this bullshit guise of rigor that is fundamentally underserving people of color, right? So producing that perfectionism is, is really racist, right? Do less and divest resources, right? If you have access to money, give it away to people who don't have access to it. It's, I don't care what form, right, or what where you're at in terms of your social location, divestment is the number one thing white people need to be doing, right, with their resources and with their energy. So you need to stop overproducing labor for the daddy, because at the end of the day, you're still not going to be the daddy because <laughs> you're the girl. So like you have to replace that system in order to be equal, not stand on the backs of other people and, and steal the resources. So I think, you know, toxic white femininity is really terrible. It also comes out in microaggressions and macroaggressions, right? So, you know, white women are terrible at work and say stuff to women of color all the time. So it's like, you're too angry or um, you're too strident or 
Anything that's tone policing is toxic white femininity, right? For the most part, anything that's about looks or body is racist, right? So they do that stuff all the time. Where are you from? Who does your hair? Can I touch it? That stuff is all racist. And there's also like total lack of boundary, right? Totally lack of boundary. Um, and it's not innocent either. That's the thing. It's it, this, these are not innocent behaviors. They're historically produced through violence. So it's not like, well, I didn't know. You did know because when somebody said something, then you immediately collapsed because you knew it was wrong. So it's people who do that kind of stuff. It's not like there's no like, I don't know, plausible deniability about it, right? There are honest mistakes that can be rectified through honest conversation, but microaggressions and macroaggressions are, you know, inexcusable. There's no reason to not know that you're doing, they know that they're doing something wrong because it's so easy to shame them immediately about it. And so, okay, so I would say that is how it operates in the workplace for sure, right? Um, we were talking about um, perfectionism. Now, I have to confess, I am not a perfectionist, okay? I'm, slo <laughs> I'm sloppy and that is just not a thing. I, you know, and so I, I, the anxious stuff, it's very hard for me to work with anxious people because I just want to tell them like, it's okay to breathe and it's okay to say no, right? So the anxious people take on the group projects. So they're like, okay, I know what to do. I'll do the work, I'll do the work, I'll do the work. I can't imagine getting a B, I will do all the work. Do you know what I'm talking about? I see you all nodding there, yes, yes, yes. But the group work happens in the home and the group work happens at school and it happens on the, in the workplace and it happens in activist circles all the time. You have to be able, to create spaces where people can actually collaborate. And that means sharing power. It means sharing the microphone. It means sharing perspectives. It means doing vulnerability. And toxic white femininity is the opposite of that. Toxic femininity produces vulnerability as a mechanism of getting power. And not in a good way, right? It's about how can I assert my privilege so that I can skirt and escape accountability. And that's why 54% of white women voted for Donald Trump because they're on the same team. They're doing the same thing. They're skating through with bullshit overwork, right? And no responsibility and trying to extract as many resources out of capital as possible without any kind of repercussion. That's the world that they want to live in. That's who they fundamentally are. That's not a persuasive situation. It's an ethical one. It's a lack of ethics. And so I think that there is a way of understanding well-intentioned white women, right? Who want to do activist work, who consider themselves allies, whatever, uh, as politically and ethically immature, right? Like just spiritually and ethically immature. I think that's the only way to engage with them, quite frankly, is to be like, okay, well, you're new. There's just so, so much work to be done, right? For you to get to the place where everybody else is having the conversation who are actually interested in radical social transformation or freedom. I wanna unpack a little bit of, of your answer. I wanna say like two paragraphs above us. Yeah, yeah. Um, <laughs> on divestment a little bit. I wanna unpack that just a little bit um, to, to sort of pull apart or look deeper into the overproduction of white femininity and how that over that our instinct to overproduce is oppressive in a way it creates a, a, a norm that can't be reached if you have literally anything else to do um, with your time or brain um, and so as we think about divesting it's not only our money right it's our ambition or our time or labor can you t t um, unpack that a little bit more yeah, so, um, so one of the reasons why I think white femininity is so anxious is because the only way that women get to the table with white men is to produce surplus labor or to be a surplus consumer, okay? So without like regurgitating Das Kapital for the readers at home, right? That's how you ha show your value is that you are producing shitloads of extra work for minimal amount of money. Look at me, I'm leaning in, right? Or look at me, I can consume all this crap that I don't need, and so I have a big house with a bunch of crap in it, right, that I don't use. So that is what, those are the, the scales, I guess, that white women live on, right? So in order to be free, white women have to divest from either consumption, over consumption or overproduction, as modes of being in the world, right? 
because that's the, that, the anxiety is preventing you from being free. Okay, you've got to give up the attachment to either production or consumption as the locus of your life. Okay, you have to do it. There's no other way because you are property, <laughs> right? You don't have property. And so it's like the difference between women who buy makeup and men who buy property, right? One produces, like, one produces an economy and one is the consumption of economy. So what, is it, what, do you, what do you need? right? You need enough to get by. That is what you fundamentally need. But the overproduction of labor is, it does not determine ethical worth. And in fact, undercuts ethical work, worth. You know, I'm thinking of like Jeff Bezos, right? He's like, he's the poster boy <laughs> of like how jacked consumption and production in America are right now. So we were having a conversation around here the other day and somebody's like, well, how is consumer spending up? And I'm like, well, how do you showcase you're a good person in a pandemic unless you're buying stuff on Amazon? Everybody, all the white people are nesting because they're not out in the streets because they fundamentally have a misunderstanding about what the reckoning is that's coming. So they are, you know, medicating with booze and drugs. They're buying shit to numb out and they're avoiding the news so that they don't have to be accountable for what's coming. And so that is a problem. Right. But it's the women who are buying the stuff on the Internet. Right. And they snow themselves in with a bunch of excuses for why they're buying and what they're buying. But at the end of the day, the fact that we have the highest unemployment rate in the history of America and consumer spending is up is a problem. It's a red flag. And that is white ladies doing that. Everybody else is sensible and is like, I it's going to get worse. Like maybe we will hoard a little bit of rice and beans, you know maybe some extra pasta, but they're not buying new clothes, you know? So that's what I would say. It was, it's about surplus economy, right? Either production or consumption. And it's what makes white women anxious. And the only way that they know how to self-soothe, like emotionally self-soothe is through consumption or production of stuff. That's it. So they can't emotionally regulate themselves. So they're constantly in balance. So they're either anxious, 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 or hiding, hiding, hiding. And sometimes they're both. And so they create this push-pull energy, right? There's like anxious, 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 and then total withdrawal, right? Totally checked out. And so if you can't emotionally self-regulate, then you cannot participate in social movements as a person who's going to trust you. You're yo-yoing back and forth between two unregulated emotional states, and you nobody can reason with you or speak to you about like his even historical things. Like, no. Like slavery was not a, a, a necessary evil. Like we should, we, that's just not a thing, right? So if you can't even emotionally regulate to have a conversation about historical things, you cannot be present to have any kind of real participation in a social movement where people are going to live or die. And the other thing is, is that white people can't sacrifice, white women in particular, they're willing to sacrifice parts of themselves. Like they're just cutters, right? Emotionally, they're just cutting pieces of themselves and they feed them to boyfriends and they feed them to bosses and they feed them to their children, right? Just cutting, cutting, cutting. So then they're not whole to participate with other whole people who are trying to struggle together. So if you're constantly, right? Chopping off bits of yourself to keep the wolves at bay and to keep the daddies quiet, who is left to participate in solidarity? Not, there's nothing left. So then the women become middle-aged. It's like, who am I? So my students have, their mothers have no friends. Their 45-year-old mothers, 50-year-old mothers have no friends. Haven't made a friend as an adult ever. The whole country is full of these lonely as shit white ladies trapped in these houses who are working themselves to death for what? 70% of the white man's wage. Why kill yourself for that? There are reasons to, to die. That is not one of them. So, you know, it seems like an ethical thing and a priority thing. And stop cutting yourself to feed the wolves. Stop doing that. You gotta stop doing it. So you actually teed us up perfectly for the next question, um, I think. What role does trauma play in the production of normative white femininity? I mean, it's hard to not see America as a trauma cage. Okay, like it exists, it's empire. It's, the, it's been the largest empire on earth the last 120 years for sure. And so I think that's probably coming to an end. 
but that's a trauma space, right? So it's trauma as it's settler colonialism and Native American removal. It's trauma as it's Native American boarding schools. It's trauma as it's rape on slave plantations by white women, men, and children. It's trauma as it's, you know, the auction block where families get separated as a part of the economy. It's trauma at the border and the concentration camps for the Latinx kids who've been stolen by the federal government and what is definitely an elaborate sex trafficking ring. It's traumatic for the women who are trapped in their white homes with rapist daddies, blah, blah, blah. I mean, it, like there's nobody escapes trauma, right? It's again, it's a, a matter of scale and degree. So the problem is, is the entire culture is set up to deny white people as perpetrators of trauma and to um, mystify how that trauma is perpetuated by people who are also simultaneously victims. So the inability to see oneself as either a perpetrator, right, or a perpetrator and a victim is the space that white women live. It's the reason why like John Gray's Men Are From Mars, Women Are From Venus became so, I don't know, huge in the 80s is women are like, oh, my shouldn't, my, my, my husband shouldn't hit me. That could be like a thing. I should maybe not do that. We should not do that. Right. And so it's like that was the first moment. And I'll tell you why, because before that, between the 20s and the, in the early 70s, the therapists would actually recommend that abusive husbands rape their wives as a form of therapy for the women so that they would be more cool with staying married. Like the entire therapeutic space for white women in the United States has been historically so violent and traumatic that even that space has not been a space of freedom or transformation for a lot of women. And that's not necessarily the case now, right? There are more spaces for it because of second wave feminism. But I mean, it, it's not always been that way. So I would say it's useful to think of the United States is a trauma, as a trauma landscape. It's not one of joy. It's not one of pleasure. It was founded by Puritans. So it's not one of pleasure. It's not one where desires are met, where needs are met. The whole thing is about self-denial. And so who has to produce that? as sort of the benchmark for America, white women have to produce all the self-denial. That's why all your moms are martyrs, okay? Thanksgiving dinner, anybody, right? Or the elaborate Christmases, or the dreamscapes for all the children so that they have the perfect memories and the perfectly curated photographs and blah, 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 blah. All that stuff is about an architecture of the white family that fundamentally denies the role of violence in shaping it or in producing anti-blackness or colonialism. So everybody's, so like, I'm glad everybody realizes that Donald Trump is gaslighting them, but also they're all doing it to themselves too. So it's like, he didn't get here on his own fucking accord. Everybody's been participating in the ship for like the entire history of America. So like, that's not new. He's not new. He's not a sole actor. He's not the worst of it either. In some ways, he's a very mediocre dictator. Like, I think about it this way. <laughs> I, was, I was kind of riffing on this the other day, and I thought, okay, so I'm a Gen Xer. And if I went by the movies that I saw as an adolescent, in, in terms of teaching me what kind of girl I would be, the worst thing that white women ever faced in the movies of my childhood were a shitty Vietnam vet dad who had the PTSD and wouldn't let me dance with the sexy boy because my dad was a preacher or whatever. Like, that is the hardest thing that, like, white chicks – faced in the 80s when we were supposed to be coming out of the 60s generation and learning from the civil rights movement is like how to dance in the fucking barn that is not good that's not useful information not useful kevin bacon got zero people free although i would say that the i think the moral of footloose is that if you flip the moms you flip the family and so i do think that there's utility in the white women right they flipped her and then they got to dance and so she got laid and so America, you know, celebrated for entirely too long. But I'm just saying if that is your coming of age buildings Roman and that's the dragon you have to slay is your asshole dad who's a Vietnam vet and you got to dance, that does not prepare you for BLM. So. Anyway. I did not think that I would hear the sentence, the moral of Footloose this evening. <laughs> but I feel better having heard it. Well, <laughs> My kid's obsessed with Cindy Lauper right now, and so we watch the film Girls Just Want to Have Fun with Sarah Jessica Parker, which is a very fun film, and Helen Hunt, you know that film? And I'm like, girls do just want to have fun. But the problem is, is that girls wanted to have fun and not have rights. And so oh. that was the sad thing about what happened after second wave feminism was killed by Reagan, 
<laughs> right? Is that instead of rights, we had fun. And so mm, that was, turns out to be, an, you know, an indefensible. Less fun. Not, not satisfying. The fun was less satisfying than the rights would have been. So let's, let's talk about historical moments. Um, let's talk about con concrete historical moments that have produced contemporary white femininity. Uh, Nancy Reagan. Nancy Reagan, you know, I, I teach a seminar on Reagan, just about Reagan. It's just 16 weeks of Reagan because I really just cannot overstate how effective they were as fascists. It's just, I mean, so much better than this guy Trump. So, you know, she, she was starving herself to death with her eating disorder. She was having lavish parties in the White House at this time of massive social crisis in the United States, both economically and politically. They were the, she was the oldest president in America, right? Had had uh, ever, what you, you know, I mean, the whole thing was so set up from the jump to be horrific for, for women. And so then what happens? Affirmative action happens. And he basically frames that as uh, welfare queens and creates these communication devices. We call them ideographs. There's little pieces of ideology that have really stickiness, right? And so affirmative action becomes anti-black from the jump. And who are the biggest beneficiaries of it? White women. So white women get to work. And then what happens? You get 7,000 films that are all about Sharon Stone raping dudes at work because the men are so sad that they might have a lady boss. And so the next 40 years are teeth gnashing about whether or not women can be bosses. Sorry, Hillary Clinton, you were late to that party. It was going to go down that way for sure, right? So that in time, the 80s, I would say, you know, is a moment we haven't talked about specifically here, but is a moment, I think, where the, the, the possibilities for white women were over. And I would say that for also people of color, black people for sure focus then you get hip hop because then representations are easier than political economy and all the leaders have been assassinated. Nobody assassinated any of the feminists. What the hell happened to them? They just got fat jobs. They got paid out. They got disincentivized to be activist leaders. And so they got money. They got, they got Sheryl Sandberg, right? And so the Reagan moment, the 1980 moment is such a regressive moment that fundamentally rejects any of the progressive lessons of the 60s and 70s. In fact, Reagan actually would go back and sit in the movie theater at night and choose movies from the 30s and 40s and steal lines from the movies to put into his political speeches, right? Because he wanted the nostalgia that he was producing as a white feeling in the 80s was all about the white family before women had the vote or had any social power and before black people were people, right? And recognized formally by law by the Civil Rights Act. So he was consciously producing an American public rooted in the past, which is, I mean, not new to him. He was just really good at it. And that's what's happening again now. Tom Cotton's going to try and do this again when he runs for president in 2024 about this return to America that is before women and people of color had any real social rights. And that is the fantasy of America. It is fundamentally colonial. It's fundamentally fascist at its core. It, it supported the Nazis until, right, Delano Roosevelt was able to declare war on Japan. Right? Like we turned away how many boats to send a bunch of Jews back to the concentration camps? Shitloads. Do you know what country was the number one country to actually take Jewish refugees during World War II? Not the United States, the Dominican Republic, which is this big. So not the United States. Not, we were not the winner there. That's not a success story for the United States, right? The country is anti-Semitic, it's horribly racist, and it's colonial. And so, you know, I would say the 1980s are a period we haven't talked about in this in this iteration of this conversation or in the others that I think for the majority of people here who live through it fundamentally should define the way we think about sex, race, gender. How has violence shaped white femininity in Anglo America and Europe? How has colonial domination shaped white femininity and how has it been shaped against normative white femininity? Isn't it weird that you know nothing about Native America? Like if I was like, here's a map of America, write down Native American stuff that happened like at any period in any place as just like a pretest of your knowledge. Don't you think it's weird that you are nodding because you know you would fail that test? You would not even have a cursory understanding of what happened before colonization. 
That's weird. It's super weird that you know nothing about that. It's also so predictable, right? Because the whole point of whiteness is the erasure of any kind of alternative narrative about whiteness, right? So that's a problem. The fact that indigeneity like doesn't exist as an a priori like knowledge set for anybody. It's, it's different in Canada. They're like, oh yeah, the first peoples, first nation peoples here. And you have to take classes on it as part of the public conversation. They acknowledge it. And I'm also not trying to hold up the Canadians as some like paragon, okay? They had a shitty settler colonial history too. However, at least there is a sense there that there's another way to understand a relationship to coloniality that acknowledges that like a ton of these people were just crew, like just killed outright in the most horrific way possible. Even Columbus's own accounts of coming to the Americas are so full of rape, intentional, destructive, mass rape. Like, I don't know, that seems like we should flag that, you know, and we don't. So just from a colonial perspective, white femininity has always existed in opposition to um, Native America. So a lot of the sentimental literature of early America is all of this bodice ripping white low key porn about white ladies being abducted by Native Americans. And so rape and domination are an essential part of how white femininity has been formed. That gets mapped exactly onto desegregation. So all of the language from the um, massive resistors and the state's rightsers, the George Wallace's and the Fabuses, uses that rape trope of white women as the justification for anti-blackness. So it's the exact same series of, uh, of tropes that are used to invent this you know, pious, young, beautiful, white wife who's going to be raped and molested and abused by this person of color, other savage, brutish man. That narrative has always been used to justify the accumulation of white wealth and property. So insofar as white women play into that through domesticity or submissiveness or silence or purity or shrinking themselves in any way, they are reproducing these tropes that have always existed to fundamentally enrich white men and by extension themselves. So that's how that works. And what role does sex play in the reproduction of white femininity as a cis heterosexual construct? And then what about queer white women? Yeah, I mean, I think a lot of white women think that, the, that somebody's going to come and save them. And as long as they marry well, or if they find somebody who's a nice guy. I mean, basically, white women's freedom is entirely dependent on a decision that they make mostly in their, in their 20s about whether they chose a guy who might choose not to take all their money, force them to have children that they don't want, and rape them. So I hope you have a good picker, because otherwise, the culture doesn't give a shit about you or your children. That seems like mm, not freedom. It seems not progressive. It doesn't seem democratic. It seems wild, right? That the entire index of your freedom as an adult person and your children is based on a decision that you've been coached to make since you were a child. And it starts, I mean, you've seen your, you, people did this to y'all. When you were little, do you have a boyfriend? Do you have a girlfriend? You're in kindergarten. You're like, I don't have a sexuality. I'm four. I don't know what you're saying. Right. But that is the conversation. And you, you're all saying yes, 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 because it's a script. It's a script that fundamentally produces an untenable relationality where one man and one woman who are biologically complementary are somehow going to make the magic happen. And we know that that's not true. So, you know, white women try to make marriage work as a way of minimizing their negative feelings about not having freedom, but it doesn't work out that way. And so I think for queer women, you know, I think it's even harder because they get patrolled so much more than hetero girls, right? God help you if you got short hair or if you're slightly butch or a lot butch or if you sports or if you're butch adjacent or right, like that entire spectrum of non-femme gets shit on so hard. And so then what? 
So then either there's overcompensating for the tremendous anti-queer violence that's happening, right? Or there's some solidarity that's possible, but really only in the last 45 years. And even then, what's the right that the gay rights movement shows to highlight? Fucking marriage. Why? Why not healthcare? Why not? Oh my gosh. Why not property? Oh, because marriage, because it's still going to reproduce a bunch of power that does not serve the needs of women or queer people, especially not trans people. So, you know, so I'm from Ohio, Columbus, Ohio is super queer. And what happened? Gay marriage happened, then a bunch of gay white dudes amassed their, you know, wealth and bought up shitloads of the country of the of the county and gentrified Columbus. And also that's been happening in lots of other places. So that is about the accumulation of property. It's not about like celebrating queerness, even though people should be able to live together. The problem is that the, the federal government incentivizes heterosexual coupling as a way that women don't have economic freedom. So marriage is not the way to go to get free. I mean, it's, it, it's barely for most, for most white Americans, they're not even having sex in marriage. So it's not, it's not even the place to go to get laid. And if you look at the violence stats, it's clear that the most dangerous person in your life as a white chick in America is your romantic partner. How is that tenable? The, most, the person most likely to kill you, hurt you, or your children is the person that you're cohabitating with. Not reasonable. It's not reasonable. So, so yeah, I mean, I'm just saying marriage is not going to save you, and it's not the answer to any of these problems whatsoever. And in fact, it mystifies how property and whiteness produce normative gender identities and disincentivize queer ones. I mean, can I just say one more thing? Because I'm on a tear here. What about this potting? Okay, so we're having a moment that's sort of tinged with socialism. It's like, oh, okay, well, it's going down. How am I going to pot up with other people and share resources? Lay to the party. That's the whole point is how to share resources, but not hoard them as white people who also live in segregated neighborhoods where they're gonna hoard more resources with white people. So this is a critical moment to understand that that is not the way to go, right? Because what is happening is that the heterosexual family is breaking down around public education and it's gonna force some changes or some hyper stratification of power that's massively, I mean, the amount of wealth that's gonna be lost by white women right now is so huge. And the childcare burden is so huge. Do you know how many women are going to have to look, quit, have to quit their jobs because the husband makes more money? It's going to jack an entire generation or maybe two of kids just with the wealth transfer alone. Anyway, I'm just saying marriage won't save you. End rant. Uh, tangentially, one of the most sort of profound moments that shifted my thinking towards conversations about uh, ownership of property and emancipation and things like that was in my mid twenties when one of my friends just said, no one's coming to save you. And it hit me like a Mack truck. I was like, I didn't even understand that that was exactly what I've always been waiting for. It's funny um, though. I, I teach this essay by Sandra Barkey, who's like my favorite feminist philosopher. And she has this collection of essays from the eighties. that's on like the phenomenology of power and the body. She has this great essay. That's all about how women are white women are taught to reproduce this male ideal. That's like larger than them and, buff and they're supposed to be like this tyranny of slenderness where they're tiny and wayfish and it's like the per perfect recipe for having no physical power in a relationship sexually socially intellectually emotionally or economically and it's so brilliant I, I still teach it even though it's this essay from the 80s because it's like we are actually producing a culture that is is hyper controlling bodies to reproduce power dynamics that are massively oppressive. And so like, think about the movies that movies are a good place for this. We watch horror movies, like think about your scream or whatever. Who's the first person to die in all those films? A naked, blonde, tiny little white chick. How about the SVU or SJI or CI, whatever those, you know, alphabet soup of crime shit. All of that is dead white chicks all day long. Dead, white, tiny chicks all day long. So our entertainment, right? Insofar as it deals with violence is all about watching dead white chicks get told sexually dominated and then killed on the TV machine. That's not healthy, but also that's like the pastime. How many people do you know are addicted to like 
true crime stuff. That seems like an unhealthy thing. But for white women, they're doing it to feed their anxiety about how it happened to them or will happen to them. So, you know, anyway. So what kinds of things do you see white women doing that they might not consciously know that they're doing, but are nonetheless harmful? Um, I think the silence is the hardest part, right? So when you don't speak up because it's not the right time or you didn't want somebody to think something or you didn't want to appear such of a way or you didn't want to hurt somebody's feelings, like I think the silence of the communicative behaviors that's nonverbal is the most destructive. Of the verbal ones, um, I, I think that the microaggressions are the worst in the worst place. And I think in the home, it is the codependence with daughters. So the thing where you want your daughter to have the life that you didn't have, and then you just vomit all of your unmet needs and unfulfilled dreams onto your kids is real shit behavior. It's super unfair. It creates a lot of resentment. And I think it produces so much anxiety. And then I would say the last, because you know we, we have been talking about overachievement culture, pushing white girls to be overachievers breaks them. I'm surrounded by broken white 20 somethings who are like one C away from, you know, a massive life disaster. And I just, that's just, it's, that's not a good thing to like spend that energy on. Like your sense of show self should not be tied to a pandemic semester where you got to see in fucking French. Why? Why? That is not a good place to put your self worth grades or beauty or what the fuck. Don't do that. It's hard enough to be a teenager in this massively changing landscape that our grandparents stole our future from us within. Climate change is terrible. The pictures of the polar bears are awful. Black people are being killed on the streets. Like, lay off your fucking children, okay? The things are going to be really weird and horrible for a long time, but pushing them in school or at work is, like, not the way to go. It's really toxic. And, I mean, and, and they're nice kids. They, they have space to grow into good you know, humans, like ethical people, not good white children, but good ethical people who have a moral compass. So f give them some philosophy and some readings on ethics. That's a good gift, right? Here's how to be a moral person. But stop writing them about who they're fucking or dating or who they're friends. Just stop that. It's not helpful. Anyway, a little chastising at the end, a little white scolding. <laughs> uh, what advice? Oh, and... So Tammy, here we are. We're coming back to your question. Tammy. Um, <laughs> I told you we'd get there. Uh, what advice do you give women who are trying to dismantle their participation in toxic white femininity? Um, what advice do I give? Uh, you have got to manage the anxiety. It, you have to. Okay. So that's Therapeutic interventions are important to talk through where it comes from in your own personal life, but also you should be reading about anxiety and how it's an intentional product of late capital. Okay, you've got to. You've got to stop caring about the wrong people and what they think, and you've got to be active outside of your house. Stop being trapped in your fucking house. Okay, nothing good comes of that. Nothing. So, who are the people in your neighborhood that are doing good stuff? Help them divest your money, right? Like, this is an apartheid society. It is fundamentally structured around white property. Divest your money, divest your time, divest whatever energy you have into solidarity projects in your neighborhood. It's not like you don't live in a place that has tons. Where there are people like, could you do a thing? We need somebody to do a thing that you are perfectly capable of doing. Whether that's holding a sign or typing a memo or sending $20 or dropping off some food at the fucking pantry or whatever, you have the capacity to do all kinds of stuff that you are not currently doing. Make a list and then do that stuff, right? I mean, but you have to think of it as a model of divestment. You must divest. Divest from fantasies, divest from nostalgia, divest from domination, divest from um, curiosity that's inappropriate, right? Like I mean, a lot of white leaders are like, well, where are you from? What is the name like that, right? That's like fake curiosity. It's not about curiosity, it's about domination. That's about producing the other as something that's unintelligible. It's not reasonable that you don't have cultural competency about non-white people. It shouldn't be normalized that you don't know shit. It's, it should, it's not right that you are surrounded by all kinds of people from all kinds of traditions and you know nothing about all of them. That's not reasonable. You, that is not 
being a grown up person in the world. So you have to fill in those gaps. You have a moral and ethical responsibility to fill in those gaps, to be a credible adult person in a workplace or in a community. So do that, I would say. Tammy. <laughs> Tammy has a second clause on her question, which is useful, which is uh, how can we challenge it when we see it? Um, I like a strongly worded email myself, uh, and I will tell you why. Uh, people need space to process, uh, especially because white people are, are fragile. If you confront them in the moment, the, then you're just going to have to manage the white tears and why bother? I would rather they cry on their own time. Right. So I put that shit in an email, A, because there's accountability, because you can read it again. And we both know that I sent it <laughs> in, in my inbox or I screenshot it to everybody that I know. We both know that I have it. The end. But if you say it to them in person, it becomes ephemeral and they bullshit themselves that it didn't happen or it wasn't like you said or what. This is how gaslighting happens. So I like all of the things that approximate contracts. I like contracts and relationships. Right? Oh, we're going to be friends. This is how much time I have for you right now. I'm sorry, the constraints are this. Right? You engage in your own terms. I like contracts about sexual relationships. This is what I'm willing to do. This is what I'm not willing to do. Right? If you can't negotiate it, we're not doing it. I like contract negotiations about work. I'm sorry, that's not a deliverable I agreed to. I think that you should view every negotiation in your life as a contract negotiation. And if you don't know what contracts look like, might I suggest you read up on them because the entire country is organized around who knows how to write contracts and who holds them. And so learn how to write contracts because nobody around, everybody's just winging it. They're not making intentional decisions. Mm -hmm. They are all just reacting out of anxiety. So it's all after the fact, in the moment, randomness. You can't build off of that. That's not intentional communicating. There's no thought behind it. There's no ethics informing it. It's not part of a moral framework for your life. Don't live that way. That is not reasonable. So I would say, Tammy, uh, those things. I really appreciate you saying that, saying that about contracts because I think that I have experienced personally as a professional that informal business relationships or informal business uh, agreements are a really great way to limit your ability to produce what you need to produce ultimately yeah. long-term. Oh, yeah. I, I mean, not to, to frame things about production, but I'm an anxious way. But you have to limit production. You have, yeah. to, there have to be limits on it. And if you don't put it in writing, then it becomes a slippery slope. And yep. so people then who have more power than you, then just continue to exert it as much as they can, right? Given it yep. a mile. So I, my entire life is set up in contracts, right? Mm -hmm. I think everything should be negotiated this way. You know, I like you, I want to spend time with you. Realistically speaking, given the pandemic in my life this way, I can probably only talk to you once a month at this point. And I'm sorry, the rest of it is survival and protest. So hmm, I don't know what to tell you. Like freedom is more important than, you know, kvetching about whatever bullshit's happening in the day to day. Like I, I can't do it, right? I don't have to, I don't have, but it's also like women just word vomit their feelings at other people. You don't ask like, do you have the bandwidth to hear about this thing that happened to me, mm -hmm. right? Cause you can't set boundaries for yourself. So you can't set them in relation to others. So I would say boundary setting is like, a priori important space for white women to be able to find space to rebuild themselves as ethical creatures. Make boundaries, use contracts to do it. Uh, last question from our formal set. And then if anybody has a question that they want to drop in the chat, get it to Rachel Woody Pumford ASAP. Um, and we'll try to hit them all and be respectful of your time. So final question uh, from me, how do we understand BLM as a call to dismantle toxic white femininity? I mean, I will tell you that I saw a bunch of people at that pussy hat march in Washington in 2017, and I did not see those people out at the BLM marches. Where are they at? I had a colleague, a boomer colleague, who's like, oh, are you going to the March on Washington for women? And I said, no, and she said, why? And I said, I've been to all the marches in my entire life in Washington and it hasn't produced shit for me. So why don't you take that money and put it into the local abortion fund or <clears throat> give to the folks who are doing prison divestment 
or here are a myriad of things that you could do with the $3,000 you're going to spend to go and feel good about the fact that you did not participate in the movements of the 60s, even though you were of age. And instead of doing that nostalgia tour for a thing you didn't participate in, maybe you could give it to people on the ground who are actually struggling. And that did not go over well, as you might imagine. And so we didn't talk for two years. I feel fine about it. But I'm just saying I said it right to her at work. And that's what she was doing, right? She was just cruising 60s radical nostalgia, trying to be close in proximity to politics or whatever, without having any sense about what actually needs to be done on the ground. So that was a bunch of self-aggrandizing bullshit. And a bunch of those women, I'm sure, uh, are just hoarding shit in their white houses now. But they're not out writing BLM in front of their yards or teaching their kids about John Brown or, you know, or fucking Frederick Douglass. They're not reading what is this, what went to the slaves the 4th of July. They're not doing that stuff. So, you know, I would say that for me, it's impossible to not see BLM as a clarion call to white women for their complicity. Every white woman is one panic attack away from calling the cops and killing a black kid. Every single one. Why? Because they have no idea how communities work. And their, and their anxiety is so over-determining their responses to situations that they cannot be trusted, period. You know, I get, I get invited to talk to like student groups all the time, right? And so sometimes I get in, invited to talk to all black women's groups who are students, who they wanna hear about the research, whatever. And I'm like, you just cannot generalize the thing I'm saying to other about what other white women. I mean, white women who do radical race work there's so few of them. You cannot gen just generalize like all women do this, white women do this kind of work. You, you have to take white women where they are and they need to move to a more radical place. And so, you know, I think BLM is an explicit critique of the way that white women comport themselves through respectability and civility politics, the way that they support white men who are serial abusers of black people and the way that they raise white children to be assholes. Um, who oppress other kids of color. And so it's it's an explicit thing. And the fact that there's so many black moms who are producing BLM and white women don't see the disconnect in their own parenting behavior is, I think, a problem. And so there's no other way for me to see BLM other than as an explicit critique of conventional white feminine, especially white motherhood. Yeah. All right, so questions from the chat. Um, what are your thoughts on Greek life? Anti. My kid was driving through when she was very teeny and she was like, why are all those girls wearing the same shirt? And why are they all going into that giant house? And I explained to her about sororities and she's like, they pay to live there all together? And I said, yeah. And she said, they all look the same. And I said, that's right. That is whiteness right there. It's, it's, it's replicating sameness as a way of consolidating interpretive power and political power. And that's what's happening there. They're all gonna marry the boys who live next door and they're gonna keep all their family wealth and not pay inheritance tax on it and produce little white kids with trust funds as a way of maintaining familial wealth. And no, you could never live, I will never ever give you money to live in one of those houses under any circumstances. So I'm anti. That's well, I should say that <laughs> I should say though that black sororities and fraternities are totally different. They exist in oppositional mm -hmm. space. Okay, so they're out there. Yeah, I see you, Renata. I see you. Yeah. Uh -huh. No, they are fun. They exist in oppositional space as a way of carving out interpretive power in predominantly white supremacist institutions, and that that is serious stuff. Okay, that is where political power exists. That's where black politicians come from. That's how HBCUs get rebuilt in the face of federal austerity to higher ed. Like that is some serious shit. So I fundamentally support any black organizing in, in inside institutions, even if they're predominantly white. Uh, okay, final question. So what are some strategies for getting past civility politics within the workplace? You know, you have to be able to say real things. I think one of the reasons why white people stay away from black communities generally, but black organizing is because black people don't have the option to be fragile. Okay, because they're surviving in a white supremacist culture. And so white people cannot handle the level of truth that comes out of black mouths about everything. Right. So they can't do real talk because all of their behavior is about this, you know, fiction of the family and of what should be said and what can't be said. And so they have no practice in being honest. 
And there are no activist spaces full of people of color where honesty is not happening. I mean, there's bullshit happening too, but the, the, the mode of engaging with the truth is so very different than the way that white people live that they can't manage the friction caused by confronting their failure. And so I think, you know, for white women, confronting failure is essential and they are not taught to do it. There's not space for them and their families to do it. And so they create the perfectionism instead and it creates fear. And fear is really hard to get rid of and it's hard to trust people who are fearful all the time. So I would say if you're gonna confront it, especially in the workplace, you have to be honest. You have to say hard things that people don't wanna hear. You have to call people out for their shitty behavior. You have to restructure money things where people have been you know, taking money from the trough for so long. You have to cut off all of those access, the access to patronage that sustains white supremacy and people get pissed. And so then you have to fight about it. And if you haven't been taught how to fight against white people, then you're not gonna be good at it to start, but you have to do it anyway. I mean, you just have to, you have to, you have to find examples of people who do fight and you have to ingrain it into your psyche. So whether that's watching Ocasio-Cortez's speech about Ted Yoho the other day, which was so amazing or what, you got to sear that shit into your brain because there are people who do know how to fight and it's inexcusable to not know who they are because they exist everywhere right now. Okay. Whether it's Vencedemos who's fighting against Tyson for mm -hmm. the Marshallese and Hispanic Latinx workers who are just being fucked over by John Tyson or whether it's, you know, so I, whether I, whoever it is, right? You have to. It, this, this, there's no shortage of people who do know how to do these things. It's your responsibility to seek them out and listen to them. Put them in your earbuds and put them in your brain because you have uh, all of these examples to learn from, and they exist as contemporaries to you. So just pipe them in to your psyche, right? And buff yourself up to do the same thing. Okay, Lisa, Dr. Corrigan. What do you think? Like Is that we're, useful? We're so familiar now. Yeah, I know we are. Good thing, Rob. <laughs> this is a good thing we got going here, I think. Um, I just, again, I, I appreciate all of the things you bring to the table. This one was, I think, really important. It was important for me to hear. I think the audience, I saw a lot of nodding. So I think that we're on to something. Um, as I mentioned earlier, we will throw this up on YouTube within a couple days. So please feel free to share it with all of your fragile uh, white female friends. And we can continue building a collective of women who may be uh, learning to fight a little bit better. And if um, anybody has suggestions for your further forums, uh, Robin is obviously online in the page and you're welcome to inbox me. As long as there's interest, I'm happy to keep doing these. Uh, I, I find them delightful. So thanks for letting, listening to me rant at you tonight. Yeah, I mean, I don't see the pandemic ending soon. So I feel like Zoom format will be uh, relevant for a while longer. So yes, please send us your suggestions. We do run out of good ideas on our own. So <laughs> thank you so much, everybody, for joining us. Thank you, Dr. Corrigan. Um, we'll let you know when the next one is. And we'll throw this one up on YouTube soon. Thank you all for coming. Take care, all of y'all. Bye.